Hello everyone and welcome. I am very happy and excited as we have yet another wonderful occasion of the inspiring online seminar series of TUBITAC, Research Institute for Fundamental Sciences, which were organized for national and international audiences. It is my distinct pleasure to let you know that this evening our speaker is Professor Faye Dauker from Imperial College, London. She has kindly accepted our invitation to join us for this seminar and will give a great talk entitled Physics and Experience. The talk is part of our Mathematical Physics and Applied Mathematics seminar series. At the end of the talk, we will have a session for questions, which one can ask by sending a message through the chat button of the Zoom platform or by using the microphone. Faye Dauker is a British professor of theoretical physics at Imperial College, London, and an affiliate of the Institute for Quantum Compu Computing. She conducts research in a number of areas of theoretical physics, including quantum gravity, the foundation of quantum mechanics, and the causal set theory. As a student, Faye Dauker was interested in wormholes and quantum cosmology. She was awarded the Tyson Medal in 1987 for her work in mathematical tripos at the University of Cambridge and completed her PhD on space-time wormholes supervised by Stephen Hawking. Kay Dauker did her postdoctoral research at Fermilab at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and also at the California Institute of Technology. She delivered the eulogy at Stephen Hawking's funeral, describing him as her teacher, mentor, and friend, and asserting that his influence and legacy will live forever. With this, I want to thank once again, Professor Fei Dauke for joining us for the seminar. We are really looking forward to it. Over to you, Faye. Thank you very much, Alikram. And let me say how happy I am to be here. I would love to be there with you in person, um, but until that is possible, this is a very nice um, event and opportunity for me. I'm very grateful for the invitation. I have found that it has given me great solace and comfort to be able to commune with my colleagues all over the world in this difficult time. And I feel that as scientists, we can continue to build our community of scholars who are pursuing knowledge and the truth in a way that I hope can continue to be without boundaries and without borders. Let me try to share my screen with you. I'm not sure that I'm able to do that. Is that, oh yes, here we go. As Alikram said, I work it's on perfect. quantum. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good. So, uh, as Alikram said, I work on quantum gravity. And that's a theory that doesn't exist. So, it's a strange thing to work on. So, what we mean when we say that we're working on quantum gravity is that we're seeking to discover, create, um, construct a theory, a theoretical framework for all of fundamental physics that will not exclude anything. So that in particular, it will include our best understanding of space, time and gravity, general relativity. And it will also include our best understanding of matter, quantum theory. And so we call this over, overarching 
framework for all of physics, quantum gravity, because that names one of the biggest barriers that we currently have to understanding physics as a unified whole. The fact that general relativity is a classical theory, it assumes that matter is classical and does not incorporate the quantum nature of matter. So how do we get there to a theory of quantum gravity from where we are now? We have our very successful theories, which work very well in their, do their own domains of applicability. And I think most workers on quantum gravity believe that probably the concepts that are going to be involved in a deeper theory of quantum gravity are going to be probably rather different from the concepts that we have now in our currently successful theories. So how do we make that conceptual leap from our best understanding that we have now to this new, new theory, new conception? Well, I'm going to trace one set of ideas and heuristics that have informed the particular approach to quantum gravity that I work on. And it, it, I'm going to stress conceptual and what you might call philosophical arguments. And I'm not going to say very much at all about technical, technical details. Um, I understand that this audience is rather broad, so I didn't want to go into any, um, anything, anything particularly technical or mathematical, but I'm going to stress the conceptual aspects of, um, of the story. So physics is different from mathematics. We use mathematics in physics, of course, and mathematicians are very, they build whole worlds in which to do their, their mathematics. And if that world is rich enough, it, if it contains enough, um, enough to discover within the world, then mathematicians are happy to explore within any kind of world that they might create. Physicists, however, are constrained. We also build worlds. So there are many, you could say that each approach to, this, to the problem of quantum gravity is in the business of world building. It's building a particular um, world picture, if you like, particular framework. But in the end, we're not like mathematicians, physicists are not like mathematicians. We're not allowed to continue to explore these worlds just to our heart's content because we find them internally interesting and rich. They have to conform to experience. They have to accord with our experiences. In other words, they have to be what people call empirically correct. They have to, there has to be a correspondence between our experiences and the world that we're building within our, within our physics, with a theory, if you like. Now that's a complicated business. Einstein stressed that that coordination between the theory that we build and our experience is not part of the theory and it's not of a logical nature. Einstein stressed that it's heuristic and intuitive. And when things are in, intuitive and heuristic, of course, there's going to be quite a lot of debate over whether or not our experiences really do coordinate with our theories. And I'm going to give you a very specific example of that kind of disagreement, that kind of debate. So let me start by giving you two examples of this how physics has to coordinate with our experience and how that's not as straightforward as it might seem. The, the, empirical, um, the empirical law that, we, that, our, that our physics must agree with, with our experiences, with our observations, it's not as straightforward as it might seem. So let's have a look at these examples. Uh, I'm having the same problem I had before, Alicram, which is I, I'm not able to, to advance my slides. Let me, I'm going to have to stop 
sharing my screen. Let me try Samit, once more. Samit, will you please help? What happened there? I'm going to try once more to oh, share okay. my please screen. Try once more. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Alakram, is that large enough for you to be able to read? Yeah, why not? Yes. It's okay. It, instead of fiddling yeah, with... Yeah, I yeah, understood. I'm, uh, since I can see the, the, um, the thumbnails, I'll, I'll be able to yeah, advance yeah. just That's by clicking okay. on them. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, Let's let me know if they... It, it, this way. Yes, good. So here's the first example. So this is a quotation from a book written by the philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe, who was a student of Wittgenstein, maybe not student, but uh, he was, Wittgenstein was Anscombe's mentor. And she wrote an introduction to Wittgenstein's Tractatus. And this is a little passage from that book. So she says, he, Wittgenstein, once greeted me with the question, why do people say that it was natural to think that the sun went round the earth rather than that the earth turned on its axis. I replied, mm, I suppose because it looked as if the sun went round the earth. Well, he asked, what would it have looked like if it had looked as if the earth turned on its axis? So this is a very nice example. Uh, it's very clever <laughs> of Wittgenstein to ask this because of course the answer is well, it would have looked like what we see, what we observe, because what we observe is indeed consistent with the earth turning, the, the sun being fixed and the earth turning on its axis. You would see that. You, so, so the point that is being made here, and it's a nice starting point for a discussion about, um, about empiricism in physics, the same observation of the sun in the sky can be applied, can be consistent with two different models. One in which the earth is fixed and the sun moves and one in which the sun is fixed and the earth spins. So it's a complicated business. A a comparing our observations or our experiences with our physical models. But such a comparison has to be done. That's, that's the empirical um, doctrine. So physicists must, we must compare and coordinate, try to see whether our experiences can, be co can coordinate with, with our theory, with our theoretical understanding. So the second example is from gravity. So in Newtonian gravity, there is a force on your body pulling you down towards the center of the earth. So that's true for me, it's true for all of you, each one of you. In general relativity, which is a better theory of gravity than Newtonian gravity in the sense that it's more empirically accurate, it better describes all the huge amount of data that we have now about celestial mechanics, about the uh, our observations about galaxies, about cosmology. So general relativity is empirically a better theory than Newtonian gravity. In general relativity, there is no such force. Now, which of these accords with our experience? And here I'm going to, what I mean by experience here is your actual experience, your personal, uh, I don't mean your experience of reading data in, in large books full of uh, observations of, of galaxies or, or, um, or planets. What I mean is your actual personal subjective experience. So I claim that if one tries to be, to actually be aware of all the forces that you actually feel on your body in a way that's as free of any kind of theory as possible, then that direct sensory experience coordinates with general relativity 
and does not coordinate with Newtonian gravity, I claim. So I claim that you will feel, if you attend to the sensations that you actually have, you will feel your chair pushing up on you, the floor pushing up on the bottom of your feet. You will feel no force pulling you down. In Newtonian gravity, it, there is such a force. But in general relativity, there isn't. So in that sense, I claim your direct sensory experience contradicts Newtonian gravity and supports general relativity. So this is a clear with hindsight, but how would someone have argued that case in let's say 1690? So Newtonian gravity has been proposed, Newton's laws of motion, they, scientists have found that Newtonian gravity accords very well with observations of celestial mechanics. So how would someone argue that there's something peculiar going on here, which is that they don't feel a force pulling them down towards the center of the earth? Well, here's how certain that argument might go. So the scientists would say, well, there is a physical force of weight on you, pulling you down. We know there is because Newtonian gravity works so well. Look at celestial mechanics. The Newtonian theory perfectly accounts for all that data, and so we trust it. There is that force pulling you down. But some skeptic would say, might say, but I don't feel this gravitational force of weight pulling me down towards the center of the Earth. All I feel is forces up on me. I do, I do experience other forces of comparable magnitude, but I don't feel this force pulling, Newtonian force of weight pulling me down. And the scientists would say, well, the force of weight is there. It's real, it's physical in Newtonian gravity, which we trust. So your sense experience of no force must be an illusion. There really is a force, but there's some reason that you don't feel it. There's neurology, psychology, the way that the mind and body work to produce sense experience. And that must be responsible for this illusion that there is no such force. But it's really, it's definitely an illusion because the force is definitely there. It's definitely there pulling you down. The fact you don't experience it is just some illusion. It's just, the, it's, it's psychology. And the skeptic says, well, maybe. But maybe this is telling us to look for a theory of gravity in which there is no physical force of weight. Now, of course, history is on the, on the side of the skeptic. Indeed, in the development of general relativity, Einstein realized that there was no such force, no such Newtonian force of attraction between any two bodies, massive, any two massive bodies in the universe, that such a force did not exist. Einstein called it the happiest thought of his life. In 1790, it was premature to take the thoughts of the skeptic forward. There was no way that, uh, that Newton could have made the, made the breakthroughs or, or uh, performed the development of general relativity because Newton didn't have the concepts that were needed to make the leap to general relativity. In particular, Newton didn't have the concept of the field, which was necessary in order to, to construct general relativity. So it's a, it's not a, his, this is not a historical um, conversation. There's no evidence that anyone in the 17th century had such a conversation. Um, but it's, it's interesting to think, maybe someone did think this and we just have no record of it. So what I'd like to suggest to you, and I'm going to argue for in, the, in my talk tonight, maybe we're now at a similar juncture in the history of science as 
that moment in the, in the, after the discovery of Newtonian gravity. And in this now, the, the situation is that the potentially fruitful suggestion, the analog of the lack of the force of, lack of feeling of the force of weight, the potentially fruitful suggestion is that we should take seriously our experience of the passage of time as scientific evidence. Evidence for what though? That's the question. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to argue that it's evidence for a particular direction of research in quantum gravity. And I'm going to um, argue for that and explain what that direction is. Now, the passage of time is something very fundamental to our experience. We have experiences in time. It's impossible really to, to make sense of our lives except in the context of a fixed past of events that have happened, some open future of events that have not happened yet, and an ever, a rather mysterious, but ever moving, ever, ever changing, ever, um, a difficult to pin down moment of now, which separates the past from the future. So it, it's something very deep in our experience, but I claim many people do deny that it is real, physically real. So here's an example of that. And I want you to remember my admittedly fictitious um, example of the conversation between the 17th century scientist and the 17th century skeptic. So this is a quotation from um, an interview with Paul Davies, who's a theoretical physicist. He's a, he, his subject area is quantum field theory and curved space time. And Paul Davies says, the flow of time is an illusion. See, it's an illusion, it's not real, it's an illusion. And I don't know very many scientists and philosophers who would disagree with that, to be perfectly honest. And pre presumably the explanation for this illusion has something to do with something up here in your head. And it's connected with memory, I guess, laying down of memories and so on. So it's a feeling we have, but it's not a property of time itself. Time doesn't flow that's part of psychology. So yeah, the, I want you to think of the analogy of the scientist saying, well, I know you don't feel this force of weight, but there's something to do with psychology and, and the brain and the mind that, that means that you, you don't feel it, even though it is real. So time, the passage of time is, and is an illusion. That's the position of Paul Davies. Now, not everyone agrees, although I do, think that Paul is um, right in that most scientists and most philosophers do think of time in this way as an illusion, but not everyone. So here's an example of someone who disagrees. This is a quotation from a paper called Time Really Passes by the philosopher of science, John Norton. And John Norton says, time really passes. Our sense of passage is our largely passive experience of a fact about the way time truly is objectively. The fact of passage obtains independently of us. Time would continue to pass for the smoldering ruins were we and all sentient beings in the universe suddenly to be snuffed out. We have no good grounds for dismissing the passage of time as an illusion. It has none of the marks of an illusion. Rather, it has all the marks of an objective process whose existence is independent of the existence of we humans. Now, these two positions are illustrative of a long-standing debate about the nature of time. And when I say long-standing, I really mean long-standing. I mean that it has existed ever since we have records of people thinking about anything. So thinking about the nature of the world, thinking about the nature of time. And to illustrate that, I've chosen another two quotations, one on each side of this debate. And I've labeled the two positions being, which is the position of, John, of Paul Davis, that the passage of time is an illusion, and becoming, which is a label for the position of, of John Norton 
that time is, is real, it's a real process. So on the side of being, we have Parmenides. And of course, I suppose we never really know whether these are accurate <laughs> statements of what these ancient thinkers said or thought because they are, we commune with them via so such a long period of time and through so many and only we only have reports of reports of what they said so so anyway th this is some some statement attributed at least to parmenides what is has no beginning and will never be destroyed it is whole still and without end it neither was nor will be, it simply is now altogether one continuous. And on the side of becoming, that the passage of time is a process, I've chosen this quotation from a book um, on Buddhist logic by Theodore Shabatsky. And this, he's describing here the Buddhist doctrine of dependent origination, which is almost it's nearly as old as, as Parmenides. There is no matter, no substance, only separate elements, momentary flashes of efficient energy, perpetual becoming a flow of existential moments. So thinking about the nature of time engages us in ancient traditions of thought. And it's one of the joys of working on quantum gravity that one is, bring, is bringing in to one's scientific practice this sort of engagement with the thoughts of many, many, many people over such a long period of human history. So these two positions, being versus becoming, it is said that modern physics, in particular general relativity, favors being. So, in the debate between being and becoming, general relativity is evidence for the position that the world simply is. So what, here's an example of someone saying exactly that. The, this is a quotation from Sean Carroll, um, who's a cosmologist, um, and he wrote this on his blog. So he says, modern physics suggests that we can look at the entire history of the universe as a single four dimensional thing. That includes our own personal path through it, which defines our world line. This seemingly conflicts with our intuitive idea that we exist at a moment and move through time. Of course, there is no real conflict, just two different ways of looking at the same thing. There is a four dimensional universe that includes all of our world line from birth to death, once and for all. And each moment along that world line defines an instantaneous person with the perception that they are growing older, advancing through time. So I want to explain now a little bit why it is that general relativity supports this view, what people often call the block universe view. So it, the side of being in the being versus becoming debate is off, the side of being is often referred to as the block universe. So all events, past, present, and future, exist in a block in this timeless way. So why is it that people say that general relativity, that, so Sean Carroll here is talking about general relativity, why is it that general relativity supports this block universe um, picture? Well, to explain that, I want to step back, take one step back in the history of science to Newtonian physics, to the view of space and time that existed before general relativity, to contrast the picture that general relativity gives us. So in Newton's worldview, the worldview of Newtonian physics, space-time can be thought of as being four-dimensional, just as it is in general relativity. But Newtonian space-time is made of slices of space stacked up one on top of the other in the way that I've shown here in this cartoon. 
So this is a cartoon of four dimensional space time, which one can't draw. So it's a three dimensional picture of a four dimensional, actually it's a two dimensional picture of a three dimensional thing, which is supposed to stand for a four dimensional space time. So each of these slices here is supposed to be three dimensional space. And it's, uh, it's some picture from the double, from the Hubble deep field of galaxies. So, so there's space at, and each one is at a particular time. So this is at time t equals zero. One unit of time later, this is space again. Two units of time have passed and this is space. Three units of time and this is space. And it's an axiom of Newtonian space time that for every continuous, every moment of time on this continuous time line, there is space at that moment. So, so I've only drawn four slices, but there are continuously infinitely many such slices that fill in between these slices that, that are illustrated. And they form then a four dimensional thing, a block. So just as you stack up pieces of paper, two dimensional pieces of paper, they make a three dimensional block. Just as you stack up three dimensional slices of space, they will make a four dimensional block. So this picture is just some finite chunk of infinite space time. In Newtonian space time, space is infinite in all three spatial directions and time is infinite into the infinite past and into the infinite future. So this is just a little chunk of it. And here I've drawn two world lines of two galaxies that start at the same position here at time t equals zero. They go to different places in space as time passes, and then they end up at the same position again. So these two galaxies split and then collide again here. And the amount of time that elapses along those two world lines of those two galaxies is just three units of time for them both. So to read off how much time passes along a world line like this, you just look at this time axis, this time coordinate, and you can read off the physical amount of time that, it, that elapses along these world lines. So in Newtonian physics, people sometimes say that time is spatialized. It becomes just another dimension. You can draw it on an axis, just like the, like the three dimensions, the three um, spatial dimensions. Now, in general relativity, space-time is not like this. In general relativity, or in Einsteinian space-time, which is still four-dimensional, it's not made of space. In fact, there's no such thing as space, three-dimensional space, at all in an Einsteinian space-time. Einsteinian space-time is made of events, where events are things like that, that are localized, local in space and time, if you like. Persisting objects are patterns of events over time. So in my drawing here, this is again a finite chunk of four-dimensional space-time. There's no space here at all, no three-dimensional slices of space-time into, into space. That concept is not there in general relativity. There's only four dimensional space time. Time elapses, but it elapses along world lines. So here again, I've got my two galaxies. They start at the same um, place here and they end together. They've collided again up here and they go along different world lines in space time and time elapses for each one. But now the physical time that passes that elapses along each of these world lines can, and generically in general, is different. So a different amount of time will elapse along this red world line of the red galaxy than elapses along the green world line for the green galaxy. So if those galaxies carry clocks, then those clocks will measure different amounts of time elapsing as they traverse these two trajectories, even though they begin and end at the same events. There is no concept here of simultaneity. There's no concept of there being a set of events which are at the same time. That concept doesn't exist. And that was one of the things that Einstein, that's already true in special relativity. So that's Einstein's theory of space-time without gravity. 
So already in special relativity, there's no concept of simultaneity. There is concept of order, of the ordering of events, and I will come back to that concept um, a little bit in a little while. So in this view of space time that general relativity seems to give us, there is, and just concentrate here on this picture here on the left hand side, this is another cartoon of the universe. Now I've gone down another dimension. So this is a two dimensional cartoon of a four dimensional universe. The universe is just laid out as a four dimensional whole from the beginning, if it had a beginning, to the end, if it will have an end. And all events, as Sean Carroll said, are here in space time. And here is my world line from my birth. This is the event of my birth, this star down here. And this is the event of my death, this star up here. And this is my world line that I'm tracing out between the events of my birth and death. And that's the same for us all. We all have our world lines in space time, all tracing out our world lines. Now we may feel very strongly that we are now somewhere on that world line, moving, creeping forward. But in general relativity, there is no such thing. There's no such special point along a world line that you sit at and move along. That, that doesn't exist. And it can't exist because there's no simultaneity, because if I had my own special point here on my world line creeping forwards, then so would you, suppose this is your world line here, this green one, you would have your special point, but there's no way that I can have a special point and you can have a special point because that would produce a physical simultaneity between my special point and your special point. But there is no such thing in the theory. So, there's no special points. There's no now in the theory. There's just a block. Past, present and future events laid out once and for all in this way. I've drawn these blue lines here. These are supposed to, these represent the paths of photons. So for example, a photon can travel from its production in some galaxy somewhere far away and intersect my world line at some event here where I can detect it in my, um, using my telescope. Now, here's a conversation that I claim I've sometimes had with people, sometimes after talks that I've given like this, where it, which illustrates the difficulty there is now in communicating about whether or not this picture of the world, this block universe picture is compatible, whether it coordinates with our experience. So A thinks that the block universe does coordinate with our experience and B thinks that it does not. And this is their conversation. A says events happen in the block. There's a tree growing. There is a supernova exploding. There is a person experiencing time passing. B says, no, the block is static. It corresponds to events having happened, not to them happening. There in the block is the history of the growth of a tree. There is a supernova having exploded. There is a person having experienced time passing. But it's happened already. If the world actually were a block, we would not have any experiences at all because it would all be over. A says the block does correspond to events happening. B says no, it doesn't. A says yes, it does. No, it doesn't. And it's a debate going nowhere. And my own view is that this debate cannot be settled within general relativity. It's similar to the position of the scientist and the skeptic arguing about whether the force of weight, whether the, the, um, the fact that you don't experience any force of weight pulling you down, whether that is compatible with Newtonian physics. There's no way to resolve that within Newtonian physics. It, what it's doing, the, what the, the thoughts of the skeptic are pointing a way beyond Newtonian physics, how a theory that's better than Newtonian physics could be. So this is the way that I want to take 
the heuristic of the reality of the passage of time. It cannot be something which this debate, this discussion cannot be resolved within general relativity. But we know that general relativity is not the final story of space time because, as I said, it doesn't agree with the quantum nature of the passage, uh, quantum nature of the matter in space time. So general relativity can't be the final, final picture, the final story. And this heuristic of the reality of the passage of time, I can be a guide to the kind of theory that um, that could replace general relativity and could be a better theory of gravity, a theory of quantum gravity that does accommodate the quantum nature of matter. So that is for the rest of my talk, I'm going to explain um, how that indeed the heuristic of the passage of time has informed and helped develop a particular approach to the problem of quantum gravity. To do justice to this temporal nature of our perception that the passage of time is, seems real to us, whilst maintaining the four dimensional nature of the physical world in general relativity, a growing block seems to be what is needed. That there's a process of becoming for space time in which the past is fixed and concrete, and which, but which grows and in which the future is yet to become. And the physicist Raphael Sorkin, who is at the Perimeter Institute um, in Waterloo in Canada, has used this heuristic of a growing block in causal set theory, which is a discrete approach to the problem of quantum gravity. And is what um, I work on myself. So in causal set theory, there is discreteness of space-time. Space-time is fundamentally discrete. And the idea is that there's a smallest indivisible event, a space-time atom, where atom has its, um, has its, uh, its uh, fundamental meaning of being indivisible. And the universe, the observable universe, is made up of 10 to the 240 of these, roughly, of these space-time atoms, which is a way of saying that the discreteness is at the Planck scale. So space-time is fundamentally discrete at the Planck scale. That's one of the fundamental axioms of causal set theory. And the discreteness being proposed is space-time discreteness. I want to emphasize that it's not spatial discreteness. We don't say that space is made of spatial atoms because there's no such thing of as space in general relativity. So it's space-time which is fundamentally discrete and the space-time atoms are idealizations of events like that. So the idea is that we quantize space-time, that it's formed of these smallest indivisible quanta of space-time or events. Now, what could that that's a, an attractive idea. Many atomicity is one of these um, ancients, again, another ancient tradition. Um, but what could bind together these atoms of space time in order that what space time looks like to us is the space time of general relativity? Well, if we look at the space time of general relativity, so here's a sketch of um, a a GR space-time here on the left. Space-time points in GR have what's called a causal order. And that's fundamental to GR because of the limit of the speed of light for the, for the propagation of signals um, and information in space-time. So here I've drawn a network of causal relations of events in space-time. So I've got events A, B, C, and D. D happens before A and D because D can send a photon along this blue world line here um, to A. A happens before B because here's a trajectory of some, um, uh, some galaxy, say, between A and B. 
D happens before C, because again, here's some, uh, let's say this is a, uh, a hydrogen atom that, that um, starts at D and, and reaches C. So D is definitely before C. But C and A have no order at all. So we can say D is before A, A is before B, D is before C, but A and C have no order. There's no sense in which A is before C or C is before A. And the reason is that there's no way that anything can travel from C to A, because if it did, then it would have to travel faster than the speed of light. So A and C are not ordered in space time. This is the so-called causal order, the structure, um, the causal structure of a space time in general relativity. Now, the idea behind causal set theory is that these space-time atoms, these discrete units of space-time, of which space-time is made, have a causal order. So here's a very small causal set. So it's got six elements. And there, these elements are ordered. So D is before A, A is before B, D is before C. But again, there's no order between the space-time atoms A and C. They are not ordered. So there's no, I haven't drawn any arrow between them because there's no order on them. This is what's known in mathematics as a partial order. And it's a discrete partial order. And this proposal for the a structure that could underlie space-time was made independently several times um, by Etuft by uh, Mirheim and by Bombelli, Lee, Meyer and Sorkin. And it's Raphael Sorkin has, is, the, um, is the main uh, champion of causal set theory um, since, since um, 1987. So causal sets, this approach to the problem of quantum gravity is the marriage of, it arises from the marriage of causal order, which is there in the continuum, and atomicity, and this small causal set can't do justice to the, to the complicated network of, of relations that would exist in a causal set, which could underlie our observable universe, because that would have to have 10 to the 240 um, space-time atoms in it. The hypothesis is that the continuum space-time of GR is an approximation to the discrete reality like the fluid description of water. So water is fundamentally discrete, it's made of molecules, but at large scales to us, it looks like a continuum, like a fluid. Another hypothesis is that the space-time atoms come into being. They're not there already in a block. They come into being in a continual random process of birth and the order in which they are born is their causal order, which is not a linear order, but a partial order. And this process of the birth of space-time atoms is the passage of time. So this causal set here, if it were the universe, each of these space-time atoms would come into being. And the order in which they come into being is this partial order. So D comes into being, it is born before A. And A is before born, it comes into being, it becomes before B. But there's no fact of the matter about whether A is born before C or C is born before A. They are unordered. They are born, but they're not born in any order with respect to each other. And Raphael Sorkin has called this process asynchronous becoming. It's a process which is not synchronized. It's a process of the birth of these space-time atoms in a partial order. And in such a process, there are two different things in the world. One type of thing is the space-time atoms themselves and the order relations between them. And they are the material of our four-dimensional world in general relativity. The other type of thing is the birth process. And this process is also physically real. And this process is what corresponds to things happening. 
the unceasing cascade of birth events coordinates with our experience of the passage of time. Now, these ideas underlie an important technical development in causal set theory, which was the creation of a class of stochastic dynamical models for causal sets, in which a causal set grows via a set of probabilistic rules. Um, and these models are called the Rideout Sorkin models um, after their um, uh, discoverers. Now, how to make this process of the birth of space time atoms quantum mechanical is a work in process. The Rideout Sorkin models are classically stochastic, but they don't incorporate any quantum interference. So they're not quantum mechanical and they're not yet a theory of quantum causal sets. So in view of time, I'm gonna skip over this slide here, but let's come back to this conversation, the, the frustrating conversation that didn't seem to have any outcome. So A again argues that events happen in the block that the block is compatible with its coordinate, you can coordinate with our experience of time passing. And B says, no, the block is static. It doesn't coordinate with our experience of time passing. It only, it, 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 it describes events that have already happened. And A says, yes, it does. And B now says, ah, in causal set theory, there are not just the space-time atoms that make up space-time that comprise space time that make up the events. But there's the birth process as well. There's something new now. And it's this process of the coming into being of space time atoms that corresponds to happening. It coordinates with our, with our experience of time passing. And this is missing in the block. So B now has something concrete to hang their argument upon, something to compare to the block. It's less frustrating now, it's less um, fruitless, the, the, the debate. An event corresponds to the collection of space-time atoms with the causal relations between them that comprise it, but the occurrence of the event, the happening of the event, is the birth of those atoms. So let me summarize. I've talked about the science of time in the past with Newton, in the present with Einstein, and in at least a potential future with causal set quantum gravity. Now time in the past, in Newtonian space time, it's really about space. It's about what happens in space. Time in the present, that's Einsteinian or general relativity time, is about events events comprising this block of four dimensional space time. And if what I've talked about is indeed a fruitful direction for quantum gravity, if causal sets are along the right lines in, in our pursuit of a theory of quantum gravity, then time in the future will be about process. And then if that indeed turns out to be the case. We'll be able to say that the essence of the physical world is creation. And that would be a beautiful unity because as we know, the essence of physics is creation. And I'm going to end with this quotation from Abdus Salam. Salam was the founder of the theoretical physics group at Imperial College where I work. And in his 1979 Nobel lecture, he said, scientific thought and its creation is the common and shared heritage of mankind. Today we would say humankind. But what I like and think is important and crucial here is that Salam says that not just science, but the creation of science belongs to us all. And I'll end there. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for this very interesting 
an exciting talk. We can now pass to questions. Please ask questions. Use the microphone or write in a message. I have a question for everyone. Yeah. Who recognizes this clock? Yeah. Uh, I have a question, if I may ask. Uh, why do you think that uh, at the beginning of your talk, you were talking about the us not feeling the, the gravitational force actually, but perceiving it as if, I mean, uh, scientists being convinced that uh, there is a gravitational force, although we do not feel it. But if I sit, for instance, on a chair and put a very heavy book on my legs, I would feel some some pressure on my on my legs, and that would be very similar to the one if somebody just came to me and pushes my legs down with their hands constantly but slowly. So this also would be the direct um, logic. It would lead to the conclusion that the book is actually applying some force on my legs, which would be its gravitational force. And I wouldn't. I mean, the first thing that one person naturally uh, comments on this thing would be the force applied by the book rather than the force the, that my leg, I mean, my legs apply on it to, to stop it to move on the geodesic. So why do you think that it is somehow, I mean, while the, the people can still observe this force that is applied on them by the objects, why would it then be unnatural to think that there is a gravitational force because I'm not feeling the force, because I'm feeling the force of other objects on me? Yes, that's a very good question. So uh, I, I think what you're driving at is that it's a consistent picture. I mean, that you can interpret one's experience in the light of within Newtonian gravity, and there's no contradiction as such. So I think you're, you're right. So what, if you put a heavy object on your lap, then you feel, you feel the, the force on you from the object. But that is not the same thing as, you know, as the force that the earth is exerting on you. That's the force that the book is exerting on you, right? So, so it, but it, the, Newtonian, the Newtonian theory is a consistent theory and a consistent picture it says for example if you think about the book <laughs> so the book is certainly exerting a force on you that's a real force it, it, it i agree you feel it right so but that's that's not the missing force the the you know the the force which you should feel but you don't and, and that's the that's the force that the that the earth is exerting on you you do feel the force that the book is exerting on you but not So let me say, for example, you could put your hands on your lap, right? So, so if you, you rest your hands on your lap, then you feel two forces. If you concentrate on your hands, you feel your lap pushing up on your hands. <laughs> and if you concentrate on your legs, then you feel your, your hands weighing on, on your legs. And of course, they're equal and opposite. Not quite because they're at slightly different heights, but you know, to, a very high degree of, of approximation they are they are e those forces are equal and opposite so on your body as a whole those forces are not they don't come into play right they, they can so if you're thinking about because your hands exert a force on your lap your lap exerts a force on on your hands so that they they don't but yeah the, the the missing force is is the force that the earth is exerting on you if you uh, 
No, no, I, I that I understand, yeah. but right. I, I mean, the my logic is that then I could deduce that if I am the one who is feeling the force of the book and not the book itself, but I am feeling it, then the force that I am exerting because of the gravity would be felt by the ground, you know, like, um, I mean, it's also depends on your point of view and um, what level of deduction you want to, you, you see it, see as fundamental, right? Yes, you're you're exploring this issue of of in, of data and observations and theory. So the the relationship between them. So so sometimes when I ask people, what do you feel? They feel they say, yes, I feel heavy. I say, well, how does what does that feel like? They say, well, I feel something pulling me down. I said, do you really? <laughs> and and they they do because they what they do is they they interpret the pressure that they feel, which is really pushing up on them. They interpret that as a feeling of heaviness and a feeling of, of, of being pulled down. So, so there's, you know, there's, there's a very complicated interplay between model, between your model, the actual sensory input and data and, and your experience, your, your experience and, you know that's a very difficult thing to you know that they're so intertwined with each other it's very difficult to to you know to to separate out um and in particular i think that probably there is no such thing as direct sensory experience i mean that you know there are many examples of how you know um you 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 need the model that your brain filters the data that it's constantly receiving through to produce the you know the, the 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 experience and sensations that you have you know is is very a very complicated business and it, you're not what you're not getting is just you know raw data that's that's not what you're experiencing so it, yeah very <laughs> very complicated yeah it's a, it's a long story but thank you very much thank you very much it's very, it was very interesting thank you thank you thank you for the question okay Ibrahim Ibrahim Ojan you please. No, no, Shayma has raised her hand and there is also a question in the in the chat. Okay, we have Faye, we have one question in the chat. Yes. And also Shayma has raised her hand. Shayma, go ahead. Ibrahim Ojam, no, do you want to ask question? No? No, I don't have a question at the moment. I, I'm okay, just... okay. So do you want to answer the question in the chat or should I go ahead? Go ahead. Yeah, so I just want to, I think that was, that part was a bit fast. So I want to ask again. So, so as I understand this in the causal set theory, or I mean, this uh, third theory you um, described. So the space time atoms, they are, events right am i i mean they correspond to what we call event in gr but i miss what a process is i mean can you explain it again yes so so um the process is so is the is the coming into being of these space time atoms these fundamental smallest events so yes a, but that's, that's what's confusing me so yes. event itself is an instantaneous thing right so i mean i mean what differ, differentiates an event and from its Becoming yes, I mean, good. That's an excellent question. So, what you are finding difficult here, I think, is the multiple meanings of the term event. So, it, so because in language, when we say an event, it sort of it comes along with the con the idea that it happens. So uh, that you know that, mm -hmm. that 
the but in in gen, in the block universe picture mm -hmm. those events are just there i mean they exist mm -hmm. so they there's an, an, there's never a time when they're not there <laughs> because that makes no sense they they there's just this timeless timeless block in which all the events are present okay i mean i shouldn't use, it's very difficult to use timeless language because so that they just exist mm -hmm. the past so events in your past exist events in your future exist and they there's no physical distinction between them they just exist and they always have existed and they always will exist because because always have and always will have no meaning it's just a block and that's that's it mm -hmm. so so mm -hmm. the the concept of process is in it contrasts with it's different from that so it it says that no those events so so now now the first step is to conceive of this block as being made of these discrete events so that so these discrete space time atoms that's the first idea so so you can think of a block causal set the block causal set is just all of is just the gr the gr block but just discretized right so so now we've just got these discrete um, space time atoms right very tiny still a block size lego blocks maybe say that again like planck size lego blocks maybe they're like they they are planck sized indeed yeah lego blocks makes them a bit more rigid i think you should think of them more as more flu more fl in a more fluid manner so uh, uh, more like a fluid than a than a than a crystal let's say but yes so planck sized so that so there are these you can think of a, a causal set block so it's just the whole of space time all the events in the past all of the events in the future all existing in a in a way and they're all physically um uh they have the same physical status there's no distinction between past events and present events and future events they're just the same they have the same physical status Mm -hmm. So you can have a causal set like that. That's just a, blo a block causal set. But the process is something that you add. So you say, no, the causal set doesn't exist as a block. It comes into being in this process. It comes into being as a process in which each space-time atom is born. Mm -hmm. It's not there, and then it is there. It doesn't exist, and then it does exist. And that's that it's that process of the becoming of the space time atoms that is new it the block doesn't have it so it, it but the the it's the and the process is physically real so and uh, is this process i mean when you say process do you talk about becoming of single event or becoming of a series of events or something yes many of them oh, okay. yeah Ten, yeah many 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 of them okay. coming into being yeah okay. thank you yeah that's an it was an excellent question thank you for asking it it helped me to to be more clear but yeah so so it i wrote a paper in which the subtitle was the birth of a baby is not a baby <laughs> to make the distinction between the thing which is the space time atom mm -hmm. and the process of its being born they're not the same thing just like the birth a baby is not the birth of a baby because the birth of a baby is a it's the pro <laughs> the process of the coming into being of the baby so, yeah. okay thank you thank you We have one question in, in chat. Yes. So, um, so there's a there's a private question which I can read out. Yeah, sure. But it's a it's a black hole question, so it's not okay. So 
He says, assuming I fell into a black hole and I end up in the center alive, will I observe the end of the universe? So uh, this is a question from Ariane. Um, as far as we know, no, you wouldn't. Um, because, but what we don't know, of course, is, is a theory of quantum gravity that will, that will explain to us what happens in the singularity, what, you, what is referred to in your question as the center. So, so as far as we know, I think the answer is no, but, but <clears throat> the thing is that we don't really have a full theory that, will, that, that, we, can, that we can actually even address your question within. So, so yeah. Okay, so then the other question is, does the atomic structure of space-time arise from the atomic structure of time alone? So the atomicity is atomicity of space-time. So I don't know how to think of atomicity of time only. That's, yeah, that's a, that's a, I, I'm not sure how, how a theory would look if somehow time were atomic, but space time was not atomic. That, that's hard, to, hard for me to conceive of. So, yeah, so I haven't thought about it. So maybe there is a way to make that make sense of that. But but the the atomicity of causal set theory is a space time atomicity. So it's 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 space time which is which is atomic or discrete. And then there's a question that I absolutely can't answer: <laughs> Why is gra the gravitational force the weakest force? I've read a text saying that this force is weak because it is distributed in the lower dimensions of three-dimensional space. Could this be true? I, I don't know. That, I mean, that I suppose you could frame... I mean, it's true gravity is weak, but in a certain sense, it's also strong in the sense that it, it's, the, you know, it's the force which governs the large-scale dynamics of the cosmos. So... So in that sense, it's you know it's super important um, cosmologically. Um, you might ask, you might try to frame the question in terms of what people call hierarchy problems. So, you know, so in a theory of quantum gravity in which there are no free parameters, why are there any hierarchies at all? So how do hierarchy, you know, how do you know, how do different mass scales arise in a, in a theory in which there's, you know, there's no free parameters. And that's, a, yeah, that, those questions are some of the hardest in physics. So I, I don't think that we have any, any good answer to them. Um, so I, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to your question. Haluk Bingöl, hocam. Um, uh, unless you are asking a question, uh, I would like to ask one. You have your hand raised for a uh, while. Yeah, I, I have a question for a small one. Uh, if Please I, make yourself visible. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I'm a computer scientist, so I'm not a physicist. If I understand your description correctly, you, instead of continuous time space, you are talking about discrete time space. And then you mentioned a number which is very large, but still finite, that 10 to the 240 or something like that. Yeah. But what happens the, beyond that? Or are we talking about something similar to finite state machines in, in computer science? That you have very large, but finitely many uh, positions? So it's a question beyond the discrete continuum question, whether the universe is infinite or finite, right? So, so it could be discrete and infinite. My own view is that it's finite, but growing and it, that 
there's no reason to expect that it that it will end. So then is a there's a you know that it's it's finite but arbitrarily large. But the but at our current state of knowledge and understanding, we can't know for sure. So the 10 to the 240, that comes from just it just it's an order of it's back of the envelope order of magnitude calculation you take the hubble scale which is the distance that we can see and the which is 10 to the 60 planck length in three dimensions so that's 10 to the 60 cubed that's <laughs> lasting for the age of the universe, which is 10 to the 60 Planck times. Of course, they're the same, the same number in Planck units because it's just it, it's limited by the speed of light. So, so the age of the universe is 10 to the 60 Planck times. So the, the space-time four volume of our observable universe is just 10 to the 200, you know, it's 10 to the 60 to the power four, which is 10 to the 240. That's that's all that number is. It doesn't. So it's the so that finite number comes from the finiteness of the space-time volume that we can see. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not there's stuff we can't see beyond the horizon, that's an open question. Whether or not there's the universe, there's um, whether the universe has existed before the Big Bang and how much of it there is before the Big Bang, that's an open question. My own view is that there can only be a finite number, a finite amount of, of, um, of space-time atoms in our, in our past, and that it, it would make no sense for there to be an infinite number. So I'm a sort of, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything infinite in, in the physical universe. So, so um, yeah, but strictly it's an open question, but I, yeah, but this, Going discrete, of course, allows you to have have own, to you know to to conjecture that the universe has is is fundamentally finite. Okay, thank you. Did that answer your question? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, I uh, would like to ask a question now, if and no one else is asking. Um, Okay, my picture of the world in general relativity, I work in general relativity, by the way, uh, is not what you described as the block with the pre-existing events and so on, uh, because uh, that would be denying free will. Okay, so my picture is that uh, V uh, and uh, whatever the fields, et cetera, et cetera, are, are propagating on this uh, you know, uh, continuum uh, and, uh, but not fixed continuum. We stretch it, we uh, squeeze it at uh, places, uh, etc. So we are, uh, and, and what is time uh, to me is uh, simply uh, a, a dimension of this continuum uh, with a simple mathematical uh, distinction with respect to the others. Um, now, uh, how, how is your picture uh, different from this uh, other than uh, postulating that uh, two, uh, any two possible events uh, can must be at, uh, at least a plank length away from each other? And the second part of the question, I guess, is uh, what triggers new space-time events uh, uh, to come into being. Let me answer the second one because I wasn't sure that I understood the first one. Maybe you can explain again. But the, to answer the second one, nothing triggers them coming into being. It's it's just it's their nature. Okay. So uh, it, it's it's like saying I mean it's what they do. It's their nature. It's it's. I don't like. To, I I sort of. I, I, I don't, I'd rather not use the term law because I'm not sure that's really appropriate. Um, but if you, if you like that term or want to use that term, then it's, it's simply the law. They, they come into being because it's the law. Conservation. Of, them, so. 
example? Say that again, sorry. Any conservation laws associated with it, for example? Could there be? Not at all. I mean, it, it, because the, the essence is that it's a creation. So it's a. Because it's the number of them is continually growing as time passes because because their their birth is the passage of time. So yeah, that's um okay, but the first part if I may explain a little bit. Yes, more, go yeah, ahead. I didn't uh, understand. We, uh, you know, uh, we like to say that uh, acceptable solutions must be global, hyperbolic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, that's because uh, we want to be able to formulate uh, initial value problems. Right, uh, so uh, therefore the picture is, uh, you know, V or fields, whatever we are propagating uh, in uh, in space time, uh, where uh, the the only difference from the Newton uh, picture is that this space time can itself can be dynamic and interact uh, with us and vice versa. Uh, so uh, how is that? Uh, that doesn't seem to be. If I don't look at it as a fixed set of events. Uh, because as I said, if it's a fixed set of events, then I have no uh, no free will. Okay, so that that's why I don't uh, I'm I, I'm not not very warm towards that kind of idea. Uh, in that case, then there doesn't seem to be too much of a difference between your picture and what uh, we gen I generally have in mind, except for uh, discretization and scale. Okay, so I I don't think that that free will bears on this in the sense that it doesn't. But if everything is in the sense that if general relativity is deterministic, then no. what you will do is determined. And so it doesn't, I mean, I think what you're, you're, you're making some kind of argument against the block, which I think I'm sympathetic to because I don't like the blog. <laughs> so, but I, it's not because of free will that I don't like it, but the, it, it, um, but maybe you mean something slightly different from free will than, than what I'm interpreting your question as. So, so there's that possibility. I mean, I'm not saying at all that there's anything, that there's anything within general relativity that you can't, I mean, I'm, of course we haven't, we have no, we have no, um, no data, no experiments, no, um, no reason to doubt anything about general relativity as it is apart from so far this, this theoretical disjunction between it and our understanding of matter as being quantum mechanical. So as far as it goes as a theory of gravity for, for the purposes of celestial mechanics and, and explaining gravitational waves and everything that we're seeing about data about neutron stars and cosmology, it's that one can't fault it. So, and I think, you know, it is, it is possible to, to to conceive of oneself within general relativity, but I, but, but my, it doesn't, there's nothing in it that coordinates with our experience of the passage of time. And well, that's my claim. <laughs> and it's disputed as you, I mean, this, this argument that I, this sort of frustrating argument that I, that I used as an illustration is a real argument that I sometimes have with people and they say no yes it does coordinate with our experience so and I don't think that it can be because because of memory or um, psychology or something and I don't think that the that can be resolved that so I'm proposing that this heuristic of the coming into of this of adding this process of the coming into being of space-time atoms is it go, it's part of the development of an of quant, of a theory of quantum gravity which is something which uh, so quantum gravity you 
if one if one accepts that it's um, that it's a valid a valid scientific endeavor, then I'm using this heuristic of becoming as part of the development uh, as I'm claiming that it has been actually so um, it has actually been part of the development of of causal set theory. So it's I'm not criticizing general relativity within itself. <laughs> I'm saying that for quantum gravity, this heuristic has actually been use of becoming has actually been useful. I didn't give you any of the details of the of the actual physical growth models that have been developed um, using this heuristic, um, which are interesting in themselves. I, I mentioned they're, they're classically stochastic models. They're not quantum, so they're, you know, they're only toy models, if you like. We don't have quantum causal sets. Um, yeah. Hey, we have one question uh, in the chat, please. Yes. Uh, so the question is, or oh, two questions, or oh, three actually. Two, or even. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is the definition of time? Is it defined by movement? If time is an illusion, then why and how do we get older? If gravity is not a force, then what happens to there are four phone All oh, right, okay. Uh, yes, well, there's the definition of time is different in different theories. That's what I've tried to draw out. So if you ask the question within, so, you, so there's no definition of time. You just, you can just say in GR, what is time? So in GR, time, physical time that we recognize as something that, that you can measure by, with a clock. So the physical time elapses along world lines. That's physical time. There, there's no other concept of physical time. Um, so in, that's not defined by motion. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it has a definition in terms of world lines, one dimensional, um, one dimensional um, paths in space time. And the, the proper time that elapses is something which is mathematically defined in the theory. And so you can answer your question within a particular, particular framework. So if causal sets, if this causal set picture is right, then there's something else that you can say about what time is, that the passage of time is the birth of space-time atoms. So in causal set theory, that's something that you can say about time that you can't say in general relativity, right? So, so it, uh, definition of time, it differs in different theories. That's, and so it's up to us to, you know, to decide whether it accords with our experience or not. So if time is an illusion, then why and how do we get on? <laughs> so I think time is not an illusion. So yeah, that's, uh, uh, we get older because time passes, that's, yeah. Um, and if gravity is not a force, then what happens to their fourth and force? Oh, so I just think that's a bit of a shorthand. It's not accurate to say there are four fundamental forces. So it's just not an accurate statement. So yeah, it's a bit of a, you know, it's a, it's a bit, yeah. I wouldn't, I, I don't say that sort of thing myself. So yeah. Okay. I think force in general, force, force, the concept of force has dissolved away now in modern physics. So it's been replaced by interaction. So that, it, it, yeah, I think, yeah. Thank you for the questions. Okay. More question, please. If no more question, perhaps we can stop here. Faye, what do you think? That was great. Thank you very much for the questions. I wish that I was there with you so I could actually see you properly and it's, it is difficult to discuss online. I'm sure you can feel that, but um, I feel, yeah, that 
it will be really nice to meet you all and get to know you um in person so hopefully in the future that that will be able to yeah sure, so sure. Ex really excellent questions particularly the i particularly enjoyed the one about the process so uh, <laughs> trying to explain why yeah what pro what i mean by process these are not things which are easy i it, uh, i myself ha it's taken me a long time to come to the i still struggle you know I, to come to the understanding that I, as it, such as it is, that I have. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's hope to meet in person in future. Thank Indeed, you. yes. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Take care.